All right. If you would turn with me today to Numbers, the book of Numbers, we're going to look at chapter 24, verses 10 through 13. Numbers 24, 10 through 13. God is in control. God is sovereign over all of creation. And we really don't have the control that we often think that we do. We realize that when we face things like losing a job. We realize that when we face things like robbery or if our house burns or if we get cancer or a loved one dies unexpectedly. We realize that we really don't have control. And how could a good God allow these bad things? That is a big, big question. How could a good God allow these bad things to happen in our life? We say that God is in control. And we know the bad. We know the bad that we face because within us, we yearn for justice. Within us, we yearn for peace. And we have eternity in us. We realize that when someone dies, something just doesn't feel right about it. It's like that's not what it was meant to be like. We yearn for those things. And we know the good that God gives us because of common grace. There's many blessings that we have in having family, of having health, of having the rains. All these different things that God provides for us. We also know good from having God's word. He reveals the good things that he has for us. So how are we to respond to the fact that God is in control? What is your attitude about that? If God is in control, are you accepting that? Or are you fighting against him? It's like swimming upstream. How do you respond to the fact that God is in control? Are you satisfied with the things that God gives you? With the provisions that he provides for you? Do you have trust in God? That's basically a synonym for faith. Do you trust God with everything in your life? Even in the good and the bad. It's so important for us as Christians to be able to rest in God. And I think one of the biggest ways to be able to rest in God is to understand God's character. To understand that he is loving. When those bad things happen and we don't understand, God is loving. That God is just and that God is holy. God knows the right things for our lives. And God is in control. He is loving, just, and holy. In Numbers 24 today, I'll look at verses 10 through 13. It says, Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies. And look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. So Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me, saying, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. Lord, I thank you for your word today. And I pray that you, in this word today that you help us to understand that you are loving, just, and holy. And that when we don't understand the situations, we can understand that you work all things out for good in our lives. I thank you that you are in control, that you are sovereign all over over all of creation. And I pray you just speak to our hearts today, Lord. Help us to give whatever burden we're carrying today to you and trust you more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Balak and Balaam are two names that you probably have heard before. Balaam, we know the story about Balaam going to Moab and the donkey talks to him. Because the donkey sees the, the angel of the Lord before him that was going to kill him. And the donkey talks to him. I've always thought it was kind of interesting with that story that Balaam wasn't surprised when the donkey started talking to him. He just started talking back to him. But that, you know, that's a part of the story. But this story's got a lot more to it. So King Balak of Moab hired Balaam, who was a sorcerer, to curse Israel. You see, Israel was a great number of people here. And they had not yet gotten to the promised land. They had conquered some people. And the people in Moab were sick with dread. They were very worried about the situation that was before them. And here in this verse, in verse 10, after Balaam finally makes it to the king, he doesn't curse Israel. What he was hired for. He doesn't curse Israel. He blesses them three times. It says that Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam and he struck his hands together. How dare you? I hired you to curse these people and you blessed them bountifully. He was mad. And I think often when we're mad, in a way we're sad too, aren't we? Because something didn't go our way. What he wanted did not happen. And let's not pretend that the situation for Balak was a good situation. The Israelites had been conquering some other kingdoms. 
just recently. And now they are right outside of Moab and they see a great number of people there. And they realize that they could come in and conquer them. They were worried about that situation. So he was going to try to manipulate God through Balaam, the sorcerer. But one thing that he didn't realize was that God had actually told the Israelites not to attack Moab. We don't see this right here in this account, but I believe it was in Deuteronomy. He tells them not to attack Moab because that land had been given to those people through Lot and that that land was for them. So even though Balak was so worried about being attacked, he didn't know the whole story. And that's often how we go through life is when we're worried about a situation, we don't know the whole story. I don't think we ever really know the whole story, but God is in control. God knows what is going on there. And when we don't know all the details, when we don't know who God is, we misjudge his character. You remember God is loving, just and holy. If we don't really know who God is, we can't understand that. And we can't understand when those storms are right at our doorstep, what God is doing we would misjudge his character. You know, the disciples, they were in the boat with Jesus one time and Jesus had fallen asleep and a great storm came rocking the boat. The boat was filling with water. And what did the disciples do? They started to panic. They started to panic. Here was Jesus sleeping in the boat and their boat is about to sink. And they're worrying about that storm that's right there in front of them. So they wake Jesus up. I said, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care about our situation? Do you remember what Jesus did? He got up and he calmed the storm. That's an answer for us right there. When those storms come, have we asked Jesus about the storm? Have we asked him why that's there? Because you realize Jesus can calm the storm. And the disciples were amazed. Like, who is this man that even the winds, even the sea, listen to what he says? He's God. He is in control. He's sovereign over all creation. So whatever storm you're facing right now, whatever enemy that is that's in the field in front of you, have you asked God about the situation? Have you asked God about who he is? Have you looked at his word to understand his character? So if we know God, do you pray Thy will be done? Do you pray that? Do you pray that will be done? What is your attitude about the fact that God is in control? There's only really two choices. Either we accept the fact that he's in control and we do pray that will be done. And that will be done may be a difficult situation for us. That will be done may be going through a storm that God has prepared for us for a purpose that we don't understand. So what is your attitude that God's in control? Do you accept that or do you fight against him? And I can guarantee if you fight against God, you're never going to win. But that's how we are. We're bullheaded, aren't we? Over and over again, we fight against God even though that He is in control. But see, God has given us a blessing. He allows us to choose, doesn't He? He allows us to fulfill our highest desire, whether that is to obey God or to reject God. We have freedom as people. God is in control, but people are responsible for their actions, for their choices. Do you know that God allows every situation? The good and the bad in your life. He is in control of that. So, is everything that happened in life, is it all God's will? Or better yet, is it all God's desire that everything takes place the way it does? This is the answer to the question, why would a good God allow these bad things? We have a sin problem. The Bible reveals that to us. The world doesn't understand that without proper context. To understand that the mess in the world is from sin. It's absolutely the problem there. So is everything God's desire to happen? No. God doesn't desire that people hurt children. God doesn't desire that we lose our jobs and that the house burns down. These are things that are part of the fall. Part of this fallen world that we deal with. But about God allows free choice. God allows those things for a purpose. If God's in control, do you accept it or do you fight against those things? Do you trust him even when you do not understand? Or do you have satisfaction? Do you have satisfaction in the fact that God is in control? In verse 11, this is what Balak says to Balaam. Now, therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you. So he was promising him all kind of riches. I said I would greatly honor you. But in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. How about that? He says, I was going to give you all this stuff, but the Lord has kept you back. From honor. Are you satisfied in what God has provided for you? In the Lord's provisions for you? Or do you covet things? 
You know, in the Ten Commandments, we understand coveting. This desire for stuff, desire for people, whatever it may be. Do you think that these things, these other people are going to satisfy the greatest needs you have? Absolutely not. So what he was saying there was ridiculous. That the Lord is holding back blessings from him. He's saying you're missing blessings because you are following God. That's what our sinful desires tell us. Understand that anytime that you decide to do something that God has told you not to do, your sinful desires are saying those blessings are better than what God has for you. How are you responding? Are you satisfied with what God is in control and what God has given you? I think this is the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. When the devil said to Eve, did God really say that you can't eat everything? That's basically what he was saying there. Would a good God really make it a restriction where you couldn't do this? And, you know, in our life, we have to make choices all the time. Are we going to take those good things or are we going to take those bad things that are in life? See, God understands. He sees things clearly. And he wants us to know these barriers because you know what's beyond those barriers? Destruction. It's a sin problem. That's what the word tells us over and over again. God is not holding back blessings. God is trying to bless us abundantly. And we continue to go down that wrong path. So what is true satisfaction? How can we be satisfied in the fact that God is in control? I think that satisfaction has to come from God. It's beyond situational. Look at Paul. Paul was basically rejected by his people. Paul was shipwrecked multiple times proclaiming the gospel. He was stoned. He was in prison. He was flogged. Over and over again, Paul was being attacked. And he was getting injury after injury after injury. But Paul had joy in the Lord, didn't he? He was satisfied in the Lord. But you know, I don't think we should overlook this one point about Paul too. Paul had struggles, and we have struggles. There's going to be times in our life where we're like, I can't handle this anymore. What am I to do here? If you remember, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, didn't he? We don't really know what that thorn in the flesh is. And I think that that was probably divinely placed in that way that we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Because it's something we can all apply in our own ways, isn't it? That we understand that there's something that is continually an irritant to us. Something that's continually giving us pain in our life. And what did Paul do? Did Paul throw up his hands and shake his fists at God? He prayed about it. And he said he prayed three times for it to be removed. He didn't want the pain. He didn't want the thorn in the flesh. We don't want those things. But what did God tell him? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's where we have to go and understand that God is in control. To have real true satisfaction beyond situational is to realize that his grace is sufficient for you. Moving beyond Paul, we see this even in our current time. How many of you have known a Christian that was terminally ill, but they had so much joy about them? So much joy about them. That is a testimony, isn't it? Of God's goodness. And the fact that God is giving you a peace that's beyond your situation. What about those that are handicapped? You think, well, they can't do all the things that I can do. Yet they have such joy about them. What about those that are poor? That seem like they have nothing in the world. You know, you go to these third world countries and see these people that have accepted Christ there. And they live on dirt floors. They have such a joy about them. Where is our joy at in this situation? Do we have true satisfaction that's beyond the situation? That peace that passes all understanding. God tells us to be anxious for nothing, Right? Anxious for nothing. That peace that passes all understanding is going to guard our hearts and mind. That peace is peace with God. Understanding that you are right with God. Understanding that God is in control. That's why we don't need to be anxious for anything. God is in control. Even in those situations that we do not understand. We can trust God. We can have peace in God. Because you know, all those that God has called. If, he, if you were a Christian, he has called you. He's drawn you to him. He says that all those he has called, he's also justified. He's declared you innocent. There's no more condemnation in those who are in Jesus Christ. And those who he has justified, he is also glorified. It says that in the present tense. As good as done. The fact that one day we will be free from all this corruption. 
That we will have no more pain, no more tears, anything like that. God has promised that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you trust that? That's where satisfaction is at. That's where peace is at. So are you ready to submit the fact that God is in control? Do you pray, thy will be done, even when the situation is hard? Perfect example in the Bible is Jesus in the garden before the cross. Jesus didn't just run to the cross, did he? He was praying. He was struggling with what was going on there because he knew the pain that he was about to face. And it wasn't just the physical pain of the cross, but the fact that he was taking fully the Father's wrath for all of our sins on the cross. Can you imagine knowing what's lying ahead? You know, I said we see things kind of blurry, but God sees things clearly. Jesus knew what was ahead of him. But what did he do? He wept tears of blood and finally said, Thy will be done. Jesus never sinned. He never sinned. He was always going to be in the Father's will, but it was difficult there, wasn't it? Thy will be done, even though I'm about to face this cruel punishment, this cruel death. An innocent man on the cross. We can learn from our Lord to understand. Thy will be done even when I don't understand why I have cancer. Thy will be done when I don't understand why my child died. <laughs> Thy will be done no matter what the situation is. It's trusting God's character. We can't manipulate God. We can't change God. We can't bribe God to do what we want. God is in control. But you know what? God does give us a promise that he will respond to us. If you repent of your sins and come to Jesus Christ, you will not be destroyed. There's no more condemnation. I thought this kind of sounded like Johnny Cochran here. But if you relent, if you repent, he will relent. You remember that with O.J. Simpson? <laughs> a little bit different there. But if you repent, if you come to Christ, he's already told you that destruction's in front of you. Hell awaits you because of your sin. But, but, Jesus has died on the cross for your sins. Have you repented of your sins and come to him and trust him? Trust that he is in control and that destruction will not come to you. What is your attitude about the fact that God is in control? Do you accept the fact that God is in control or do you continue to fight him? Are you satisfied with what God has given you? Do you submit to his will? Thy will be done. Every day we've got to ask, are we willing to submit to God's will today. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? What control do you think you really have? You thought about that? What control do you really think do you think you really have? We are responsible for our actions. The Bible tells us that. That's why we have to repent of our sins, come to Christ. We're all sinners and we need the Lord. That's the only way to heaven. But we're not responsible for the actions of others, are we? We can't control those sinful actions of those around us and those that hurt us. We know we can't control God. We also know that life is not all reap and sow. You know, sometimes you have bad things come to you and you're like, I don't understand why this is happening to me. I'm following you, God. Why is this coming into my life? We don't always understand. But we can't change God. We can't manipulate him. And that's exactly what Balaam was, uh, was telling Balak here. He said in verse 13, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord. Basically, there's nothing I can do to change God. I cannot manipulate him. And that's what these pagans with their witchcraft were always trying to do was manipulate their gods. They were like, please don't destroy me. So I'm going to give you this sacrifice. That's why they sacrificed their children. That's why they sacrificed their children. That's the attitude that they thought they could manipulate these false gods. But we cannot manipulate the true God. And that's the same thing with people that think that just doing good, you should get nothing but good back. You're trying to manipulate God. You're trying to bribe and say, well, God, you know, I did really good today. So, you know, that thing that I was wanting, you, you, it's time for me, you to give that to me. And that's really what false religions go. Because they think if you do enough good, you're going to get heaven. Something has to be done about your sin. Over and over again, we're reminded of that in the Bible. I think as we grow closer and closer to God, we understand more and more how holy He is and how filthy we are. But He loves us. But He loves us anyway. Realize that God is the one that opens and closes doors. Do you trust Him in that? Has there been a door that you were trying to go through, but God closed it? 
And then you see the other side of that in the future. And you're like, I see exactly why God closed that door. I didn't understand right then why God was closing that door on me. But I see it now. And what about that door that God's got open for you right now that maybe you haven't gone through yet? You feel like you need to go through it, but you don't want to. Because you know it might be difficult on the other side of that door. God is the one in control. He's opening and closing those doors. Do you trust that he is in control? Do you pray, thy will be done? Do you pray for God's guidance? Do you pray for opportunities to follow God, to submit to his will? So what about that big question in the beginning? What about the bad? What about the bad things that happen in our life? Even as Christians, what about these bad things that happen? Why would a good God allow that to happen? That is a huge question. And that's the question that's often thrown by atheists at Christians. Why would a good God allow these things? Well, often it's because of sin is the reason we have bad things. I think you can see that perfectly with a picture of Israel. So Israel, God told Balaam he was going to bless them, not curse them. But did Israel just make it right into the promised land? No. Right after this part of the story, they actually started marrying pagan wives and more trouble for them. Over and over again, we see the picture that sin, even though God had chosen Israel as a special witness nation, as a special people, sin continued to bring problems in their life. Sin continues to bring problems in our life. If there is anything in your life that you have not confessed, you need to give it to God today. Because you're going to get problems with that. Often, it's sin of ourselves, but sin also of others is why bad comes. Those that try to hurt us, those that come and try to destroy our families. Sin is a problem. And sometimes bad comes because God allows those trials to build our character. It may not be the way that we want it, but you know, it's very much like exercise. Who in here likes exercise? Oh, okay, we got a couple. All right, we got a couple in here. I don't understand you, but that's all right. No, exercise is tough, isn't it? You have to have a desire to do that, to really work at it. And it's not going to come easy. You know, you might want a six packs, but it's not going to just come overnight by doing a couple of sit ups. You got to work hard for it. And you know what? Our character to be more like Christ is like exercise. You got to have a purpose driven that you're wanting to do that. And you're pushing forward, even when it's tough, even when your abs hurt, you continue to move forward to be more like Christ. So he's allowing bad things in your life sometimes as a character builder. To build you up. You know, we see that in the book of Job. Job never understood why all the things were happening to him. But there was a heavenly scene, a spiritual realm, Satan and God interacting there about Job. And Job didn't know it. But it built Job's character. And it's also a testimony to us today. God is in control. And what about bad leading to good? Why does God allow bad? What about bad leading to good? You know, when Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery, he didn't understand the good of that, did he? All he understood was that he was sold into slavery. Then they ended up in prison, falsely accused. Well, we know the end of the story. How he had great honor in Egypt. He saved all of his family. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. So sometimes those bad things in our life have a good ending to it. And God knows the good ending to it. And we tell you a really good example of that is the cross. The fact that Jesus died that death and took the wrath that we deserved... On the cross, that was bad. But boy, was it leading to good. The resurrection. The fact that we can be with God for eternity. That's exactly what Jesus did. Bad leading to good. And you know, sometimes we may look at sin and, and think, you know, why does God even allow this? Why does God allow this to continue on? Early on, Satan rebelled against God. Why didn't he just destroy Satan to be over with right then? Then Adam and Eve sinned. Why didn't he just destroy them? It was going to be over right then. And start over and over and over again. Well, we see Noah and his family in the ark. All those wicked people destroyed. Did that stop sin? No. Well, with this free choice, people have a choice to either obey God or reject God. And I really believe that God is just allowing rebellion to run its course. That's exactly what's happening. Because in the end, all those that are going to be living with God are those that have submitted to him. Those that want to be with God, not those that have rejected Him. So it's running its course. So there is a bad now, but there's going to be a good end. Where there is no more death, there is no more tears, there's no more pain. That's the end that's awaiting there. So sometimes bad leads to good. Also, why does God allow bad? Sometimes there is no clear answer. That's a tough one to swallow, isn't it? 
Sometimes there's no clear answer as to why this bad is in our life. We don't understand it. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. It requires faith and trusting God even when we don't understand. Trusting God's character. The fact that He is loving, just, and holy. Do you trust Him that much? Even when you don't understand. To say, God, I don't understand. But I know that you are holy, loving, and just. And that you have a purpose in that. That I do not understand. It requires faith. It requires trust that God is in control. He knows best for us. Even when we don't see the end of the story there. Do you trust Him? Do you believe Psalm 23? The good shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me by the still waters. He restoreth my soul. You think about all these things, and when you get to that valley, what's happening there? Are you running in it by yourself? What do you say in that psalm? Oh no, I'm not fearing because God is with me. That is trust. That is faith, the fact that God is in control and he's always with you. Do you trust that he is your good shepherd? Because God is still on the throne. God is in control even when we don't understand everything that's going on. He allows choice, which results in sin. And you know, why would a good God allow that? He's allowing us to have choice, to choice to reject God. But God has done something about sin. Don't think that God has just overlooked it. God has done something about sin. That's something that all the other religions don't have. Something done about sin. The fact that Jesus... God the Son in the flesh took the punishment that we deserve. He absolutely did something about sin. He did it himself. He didn't require somebody else to do it. He did it himself and took that punishment that we deserve on the cross. That's how much God loves you. And that's why God is just because he couldn't overlook sin. Something had to be done about sin. The fact that Jesus took the punishment for us is the reason we can go to heaven. If we trust him. If we trust him, God is just, God is loving, God is holy and cannot allow sin before him. You are not in control. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> you are not in control. God is in control. So what is your attitude? What is your attitude about that? Are you going to accept that God's in control or are you going to fight against him? Are you satisfied that God's provisions that he's given to you? Or are you still going to clamor for something else? Something else that's going to try to fulfill that hole in your life. And do you trust God? Even when that storm is coming. Have you asked God about the storm? Have you asked God about that army that's standing outside the gates there? Do you trust Him? Trust God's character. I can't say it enough that to understand God's character is absolutely life-changing for us as a Christian. To understand who God is. And when He says that He is loving, just, and holy... And we understand that any situation that we face, He is loving, just, and holy. Even when we don't understand. That is trusting God fully. Have you trusted God for salvation? That's the first question for everybody. If God's in control, and God has already told you that you are going to face hell without Him, have you trusted Him for salvation? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's an absolute guarantee if you come to Christ. I don't know what it is. But you're worrying about something today. There's something that you have brought with you today that you have not fully given to God. I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to silently pray. Red, if you would play. And just think about what is it that you're worrying about today? Now is the opportunity to lay those burdens down. Do you trust God that he is loving, just, and holy? Even when you don't understand whatever that situation is, have you laid your burdens down? Let's pray silently and then I will close us with a word of prayer.
Father, I thank you for allowing us to, to gather together today to worship you. And I thank you for your word. Thank you what you speak to us and that you are in control and that we can trust you. And I pray that you help us to lay whatever those burdens are just down at the altar, at your throne, Lord. That you are loving, just, and holy, and that you want the best for us. And I pray you just help us to, to trust you with everything. We trust you with our salvation. We trust you with our jobs. We trust you with our families. We trust you with our country. We trust you with our church. And I pray you just continue to, to guide us and to comfort us. And when those storms do come, Lord, that we would always look to your word, that we would always pray and seek your guidance and your will. Thy will be done, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.